Hi everyone, so now we're going into another Arcane Deep Dive. This time we're going to look at Marcus. Now Marcus is a character that most people probably don't like. Uh, he is a prick, he is arrogant, and he has an unsatisfactory death. He just kind of gets killed along the way. But the way I look at it, he's kind of a tragic, well, tragic villain, so to speak. Um, but he's a little bit more complex than I think most people give credit to. And when you look at this, I think if you were in a similar situation where he was at, how would you get yourself out of it? How would you handle that situation? I think he's not as weak-willed. He's just kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place is the way I look at it. And let's just kind of look at this from, from the very beginning. So in the very beginning, we basically look at Marcus and he is an arrogant prick. <laughs> Let's face it, he is the number two right underneath Grayson. He is the guy who treats people like crap. He is that kind of arrogant guy. But when you think about it, okay, so if you were a police officer and you were dealing with the undercity uh, elements uh, most of the time at work and you already had kind of a prejudiced position, you would be easily confirmed by the people you work with every single day. So you can kind of understand to a certain extent how he interacts and how they interact with him just basically makes it feel that everyone in the inner city are just criminal scum you know almost like you know going into most Eisley in star wars here but so that that's his attitude and and of course we as the viewers see all facets of the undercity of the lanes and we know there are good people there and not so good people there so we don't really see the world through his eyes we see it through a much more rounded view so from our point of view we think he's just basically crap now i mean it this scene doesn't help either so of course as you noticed in episode two he is of course interrogating a whole bunch of people trying to find the people who actually set off the bomb a guy spits on a shoe uh which of course are most likely marcus has, called, has one of the uppersters to have that guy thrown through the glass they go chase after ryan and her crew and and towards the end marcus pulled out the gun so this is pretty much here is marcus he is a prick he is an basically rotten scoundrel here uh, this kind of is in the same light as if you were looking at the other sort of villainous characters in this particular series. You look at Mel, who, okay, m most people probably don't think she's really a villain, but when you when you really look at the very beginning, probably all the way up until the midway point, she is like the Machiavellian political manipulator type character. And this would be like almost the epitome here of, you know, pilt over corruption as you would think it would be. And then, of course, you see Silco. We're looking at the first two episodes here, of you know the typical you know undercity boss mafia type. He's got goons. He's got an underground lair. He's got an evil doctor. I mean, he is like the criminal mastermind. You know, James Bond boss type uh, villain. There. I mean, those those are like like three different characters who you would think would be the the bad guys of this series now it doesn't always turn out that way as as time progresses, but this is kind of how things are set up so it would only be natural it would only be natural of course that marcus and silco would join forces marcus was having a hard time trying to get uh vi in the gang and silco kind of offers you know makes a deal that he couldn't refuse so to speak <laughs> And this is kind of unfortunately uh, Marcus's first instance and pretty much his deal with the devil where he just could not get out of it. Now, there are reasons why he could not get out of it, but it's not initially clear. Now, of course, Marcus goes through the whole situation where, you know, he goes in and he confronts Evander and so on and so forth. And of course, he, it ends up not going well. But in any case... He ends up in a situation here where his deal with Silco ended up not going the way he wanted. It's almost you had, again, this kind of the Darth Vader-esque situation. Like, you know, the deal is, it changed like 
pray that I do not change it further, a type of situation. So oh, that puts him in a very tough spot here. So he basically does get blood money, so to speak, because now there's blood <laughs> on the money that he gets. And this becomes something that pretty much reminds him throughout the rest of the series of the deal that he made and pretty much the fact that he can't really get out of it. Grayson is dead. It's not like he can admit to why she died. And even when you think about this, so the council wants their pound of flesh, and now that Grayson's out of the picture, probably would want something even more than that. So how do you explain the situation? Is probably the biggest thing that would face Marcus at this point. But what's also kind of interesting here is as the episode goes through, he's still like facing with the money. You see the scene where there's an explosion up at the cannery and he still has his coin. So he's still really upset about this. And he's got to do something to make it up. And what does he do? He actually goes to the cannery and he saves Vi. Now, from, from a variety of point of views, you, you would think about this is not a good thing for Vi. Because after all, if we think about the initial uh, situation, Vi wants to go back to Powder to basically make up for the fact that she slapped uh, Powder. Uh, you know, all the raw emotion over there was just like too much to process, so she had to get away just a little bit. But let's face it, at that point, Silco was there, and Silco had his goon squad, and Vi had a broken arm, or close to it, and so if she went back, she would get killed. That's exactly what Marcus said. And so that would be the likely scenario. She goes back, she gets killed, Powder gets killed, game over. Now, now some of you might think that maybe Powder isn't killed, but most likely, Vi would get killed. That would be the end of it. So Marcus saves her. Now, well, let's imagine that Marcus does not take Vi to Stillwater and just kind of puts her away for a little bit. And for some reason, you know, maybe like outside the city or something. If that happened, then Vi would come back down the city, would have again fight with, with Silco and try to take him out. But if she is still at her age, at her power level, uh, and what ended up happening, she would be killed. End of story. So, she is st stuck in probably the deepest, darkest place of the prison, so no one would find her, and that's what Marcus did. Now, now the thing is here, all of this going on, there's no record of her arrest or of her imprisonment. So, if Marcus had reported to the council, now we know the council is also the kind of the judge and jury, so to speak, of Pildover, because we saw what happened with Jace. So the normal procedure probably would have been to have Vi stand for trial, to be judged guilty, and to be thrown in Stillwater prison. That would probably be the normal procedure of how things would go. But Marcus arranged things such that that didn't happen. There was no trial. And Silco thinks that Vi is completely out of the picture. Dead, so to speak. So, basically Marcus took Vi and put her in the deepest, darkest hole he could find to prevent Silco from killing her at a great inconvenience to him because he, uh, you know, has no pound of flesh. The council wanted somebody. But there is nobody. So, but somehow he he managed to smooth things over. Uh, so at least that is taken care of. All at a great inconvenience to him, I would say. All, all, all. At a, that now's probably his way of trying to put things back right. And as you look at this, what's kind of interesting is that. You look at it, and his actions, while he is kind of dealing with Silco, and he is kind of getting 
the lower end of the stick there. He's, he's doing the best he can with what he's got. But, of course, what's interesting is this story gives us a, a pretty common reminder of Marcus is everything that Caitlin is not. <laughs> it's fairly straightforward. I mean, if you look at it, it was like, Caitlin is all the good things. Uh, you know, she is, she's also a police officer. She has a strong sense of justice. She goes down to the Undercity. She makes friends with Vi eventually. She goes back to the council. She basically, you know, tells them, you know, the injustice of how Peltover has been treating, uh, you know, the Undercity is trying to, you know, be the paragon of justice. Now, of course, from my point of view, is like completely naive set of actions and not always well thought out. And of course, you know, the council, council doesn't care and, and would, would give like, you know, two shakes of a rat's hand that the, that the Undercity has been treated poorly. They don't care. They never paid attention to it. So I never really thought that her actions were, were productive, but that putting aside, she works as a great foil for Marcus, because Marcus is everything most people don't like. I mean, he works with Silco, he, uh, he gets money, he's corrupt, he's a jerk. So, you, you know, there's all of that, all of that you don't really like in that character. And so th there's really good c contrast here. Now, of course, to add a little bit of humanity uh, to this character is you see the scene where he is burying the enforcers who had died uh, due to Jinx's little escapade there. And you see him with his daughter. And you see the scene where he's looking at Grayson's grave and, you know, tells his daughter that she was Grayson. That is a, a good officer. It's a, it's a, it's kind of a, a emotionally complex moment for Marcus because Marcus was, in a sense, responsible for Grayson's death. And you know he is is just not not managing things in in the way that you know Grayson had managed them. So it's kind of tough for him. And you you kind of get an indication that since in this scene, uh, her daughter, his daughter is there, and you don't see the wife. You're like, well, what, what happened to the wife? It's kind of odd. Like you maybe for some reason she's not there. But what we do find out, of course, is that basically, uh, like Marcus's wife is gone, so he's a single dad, and so he has to raise his daughter by himself in the best way that he can. That's very, it's very clear from those pictures. You can see daughter and then him and then the wife is kind of flying around basically making it clear that uh, the wife is dead. So you, you look at that and you see the reason why he did not pull the trigger here. So it's like most people are like, why didn't he just pull the trigger? Why didn't he just like I mean, he had the chance he could have, you know, just committed suicide right here and there. Would have basically solved the entire problem. Silco, Silco would be dead. He would he would have sacrificed himself. The city would be way better off. Maybe, <laughs> maybe we'd be a bit better off. I mean, if you look at the way they. The entire series end, and it's like maybe, maybe not <laughs> uh, situation. So that's kind of the thing. So of course, from Marcus's point of view, it's like if he did actually go through that and sacrificed himself, what would end up happening was his daughter would have no one to take care of her. That would be it. So you can kind of see that Marcus's major weakness is the fact that if he died for whatever reason. He would leave his daughter parentless. And who would be able to take care of that daughter? We don't know the you know, the family, what kind of family or relationships he has, uh, even with the rest of the Piltover police force and what would really happen to uh, the daughter if he was gone. We don't get any of that. But we do get a strong sense that 
Marcus cannot sacrifice himself because he cares for his daughter. And in a sense, he's like, okay, we, we kind of understand that. But if you put that in your head, you, you get a sense that it's pretty much this button right here that kind of controls the rest of how things, and he is kind of stuck in a place that he cannot get outside of Silco's grasp. So Silco pops up once finds out that Bai is back, and of course, so Marcus has to uh, do something. And basically, his worst nightmare has come true. He he had kind of saved Vi, but Vi came back out from the prison, and so of course Silco is obviously angry and threatens threatens his daughter in a very kind of mafia-like way. You you you'd think this would be like the Godfather or some scene right here, and so. What does Marcos have to do? He has to actually have to go and he has to make sure that, you know, everything is pretty much barricaded on the bridge. Pretty straightforward there. And that leads up to this scene right here. Now, here is where Marcus is, like, basically has a, an incredible dilemma. Now, people who look at this scene, would probably think, okay, here's a guy who is, is really reluctant to shoot Caitlyn for whatever reason. Now, now, the thing is, is he is basically screwed up. He, there is no way out of this situation. For him, there's no option but death for somebody. Because, let's, let's look at this. So, he shoots Caitlyn. Just imagine he shoots Caitlyn. If he shoots Caitlyn in front of the police officers, pretty much he's dead. I mean, he's going to basically, what's going to end up happening, shooting an officer, maybe he could say that, the, you know, Caitlyn was a renegade officer and that she had betrayed, blah, blah, blah. Might not, he might be able to make that story. Or what could have easily ended up happening is that word gets out that he is corrupt and that he had shot, not shot Caitlin. You can imagine the Caramans would be really upset. So he's not getting, he's not getting out of that situation uh, as the sheriff of Eldover. He's, he's going to be gone. He's probably going to go into prison. That basically means that his daughter will be fatherless. Uh, I mean, killing Caitlin is big deal. As far as a counselor, you just don't kill a daughter of a counselor and expect to get away with it. There's no, there's no amount of corruption or or storytelling that you can do to get to get you out of that. It's it's going to be very hard. So there is that. But okay, if he does not, and Caitlin and Echo uh, get away, then basically what will end up happening is that his deal with Silco will be made public and most likely that Silco will have him killed or Piltover will have <laughs> will have him arrested, thrown in prison and he'll die there. So either way, if he shoots or if he doesn't shoot, uh, he is basically screwed over and his daughter will not have a father. That is basically what's going to end up happening. And and so he he's kind of He's like, you know, ripping, he, he's like, he's probably really mad at the whole situation. It's like, I, you know, I can't, I, do I shoot her or do I not shoot her? It's like, I'm not really sure. And that, that is a whole hesitation to say, is if, even if I shoot her, will this even be better? And, it, and it's like, it's not better. And so he ends up dead. Which was like the only, only option for him. The only fate that would wait for him would, would, would be to, it, be found out and and killed. So it was like his entire balancing up act, the basic the final result of him dealing with the devil, so to speak, with Silco, is death. And what's also kind of interesting and a little bit ironic in the scene is you see Jinx basically walk across the bridge using uh, the same song, humming it, as you hear in the very first scene of the very first episode. 
and basically he dies almost a senseless death as many of the people who did on the bridge in the first episode in the first scene it's it, it's kind of come full circle and so to speak with that imagery it's it's really horrible it's really tragic when you think about it it's like marcus pretty much set everything in action for this final scene to happen when he first made the deal with Yoko. And there was no way he could figure out that would be an honorable way to get out of it. And also a way that would make sure that his daughter would be properly taken care of. It, there's, it's, 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 it's tragic all the way around. It's like maybe you think he should have been stronger. Maybe he should have been brighter. Maybe he should have done this or, or done that. And, and the way I look at, at it from his background and look through the entire through line of his story and he's like there was just no possible way out for him it's really sad but given that he's still a great character to compare uh, to say Caitlyn and also of course a great character to compare to Silco because after all uh, Silco himself who was someone who was given the choice of sacrificing his daughter in the case of Jinx for the city, and Sukko did a similar thing of not uh, actually sacrificing. But again, Sukko <laughs> and Jinx were totally different characters with you know totally different options. Of course, if, if in his and Sukko's case, it's much easier. He didn't have you know a minor that he had to worry about. He had a, basically a full grown adult who, in Sukko's point of view, is perfect. So it's it's kind of a different calculation. But in, in any case. I think Marcus is just one of those characters who it was just set up to be a tragic prick. And that is all I can say about this. But it's like, he's not, he's not like a completely awful two-dimensional character. There's just so much more. The more you think about it, the more you dig into it. And all these characters are like that. And it's just so fun uh, to actually get into this. And I will see you in the next video. Bye-bye.